Um, everybody at Fulbright Iceland, uh, Belinda, Pieter, Sole, and, and, and of course, Mia, who's not here, um, who became a good friend of uh, our daughter, Ellis, uh, while we were here. So, um, and Robert Haraldson at the University of Iceland, who is a good friend and really made it possible for us to be here and helped us find our apartment and uh, helped explain when we were not understanding certain customs and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, Sole also has my further thanks for converting my photos and text into PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I've never used PowerPoint before, so I'm a bit of a novice. Uh, okay, so um, I was going to start by just showing you a few personal photos. Uh, my wife and I actually lived in Iceland 14 years ago. And uh, at that point, at that time, we were recently out of graduate school. We only had bicycles. We weren't really able to get around much. We went from the library to our apartment and back. Uh, this time around, we were fortunate enough to get a used car. And so we've been going out on weekends and investigating the country. And so I just wanted to show you a few photos of that. Let's see, so how do I move? Oh, here we go, Sl next slide. So there you can see my daughter, Ella. Um, we did get to see the volcano while it was erupting. We hiked out there. Uh, and there you can see, we, al we also did some whale watching. Although we didn't see much, the whale, it was a little on the horizon. We weren't sure it was a whale. We did see some dolphins that were closer. Um, uh, we got to see uh, Gullfoss, uh, including a rainbow. Um, this was just off out hiking uh, along a river. And these are the kind of things that we just, you know, you just discover in Iceland, which is incredible. A rural church. Um, this is uh, a lake near near where we, we, we live in Copapor and uh, walking around a, a nearby lake. Let's see, here we go. Um, visiting the old uh, lighthouse and not sure how to say, Kronos. Uh, sunrise, sunset. And that is the moon quite early in the morning. <laughs> so. Okay, so uh, Kierkegaard, uh, born in 1813, died in 1855, so 42. And he is, I, I like to think of him as sort of the Socrates of Copenhagen. He, uh, Socrates is sort of his hero, and he wrote about him. Uh, frequently in his different writings, but he also sort of thought of himself as a kind of so Socrates in Denmark. Um, and in particular, thinking about how people live and um, whether their uh, understanding of themselves as Christians uh, maps on to how they actually live their lives. So he, he, he thinks that sometimes people, there's a kind of self-deception between how you think of yourself and how you actually live. And he's interested in trying to communicate that to people and the challenges uh, associated with that. Ooh, uh, a little echo. Uh, we don't have any photos of Kierkegaard. We do have some drawings, some idealized. Uh, I like the the one on the right. Uh, it's not as romanticized, but I think uh, it has kind of a, a sweet smile. Um, we also have caricatures of Kierkegaard, um, some even more grotesque than these. Uh, <laughs> and I like this one um, on the left, where he's sort of shown walking in in, in a in a town square. He liked to walk about a lot. Uh, as did Socrates. And then you can see uh, he, he has appeared on, on, on Danish stamps. Um, so the, the course that I taught here uh, focused on this book, The Concept of Irony. And it was Kierkegaard's uh, Magister dissertation, which is sometimes I mean, literally translated as master's uh, thesis, but it's more the equivalent of a PhD. 
is over 300 pages. It's one of the world's longest master's theses, if it's a master's thesis. Uh, and um, at the time, he petitioned the king to write in Danish. You had to write in Latin unless you got special permission. And he claimed that his subject, uh, irony, was something that you couldn't write about in an, in an ancient language. And that you needed a modern tongue. And so he did get permission. I think he was the third who was officially given permission to write a dissertation in, in Danish. Uh, but he did know the classic languages and he, he, defended, he publicly defended his dissertation in Latin for a, about seven hours. Uh, so it was pretty rigorous, <laughs> uh, more than we have to do these days, I would say. Um, uh, my course uh, was a seminar. And we had uh, mainly uh, Icelandic philosophy students, but uh, we also had a student from Great Britain. We had a student from Finland. For a short while, I had a graduate student, an Icelandic student in history, who eventually decided uh, Kierkegaard and his uh, master's thesis were not going to work. Uh, but it was nice having kind of a mixture of people. Uh, mainly we were reading in translation in English. Uh, some of my students read in Icelandic. I had one student who was reading it in Danish. So we had kind of a nice uh, mixture, mi mixture that way. Um, Socrates, of course, was uh, the main figure uh, in this book. And Kierkegaard, as I mentioned, was fascinated with Socrates his whole life. Um, he, the subtitle of, of this book um, on the concept of irony is with constant reference to Socrates. And he frequently would uh, appeal to Socrates, model his life after Socrates when he was feeling down or discouraged or misunderstood, which was often, he, he would kind of have uh, internal conversations, imagined conversations with Socrates. Um, in his dissertation, he's focusing on uh, Socratic irony, but at other points in his life, he would he was more interested in Socrates as an ethical figure or as a, a kind of religious intellectual martyr. So depending on uh, his own concerns, he, he could often find uh, qualities of Socrates that would uh, reflect were reflected uh, in his life as well. Um, Now, in, in the book, uh, The Concept of Irony, it is an investigation into what irony is. And, and Kierkegaard has a discussion of and what we're used to thinking of irony is as a figure of speech, uh, maybe saying the opposite of what you mean, uh, or saying something where the your meaning on the surface and, and, and what you intend is, is in opposition in some sort of way. Uh, you know, frequently with irony, we don't really we know that when we're when we're encountering it, that there's more to what's being said, but we may not be sure exactly what. Uh, one of my favorite examples is um, this uh, this photo here is from a, a Japanese film, uh, Tokyo Story, by uh, by Ozu, and um, in, in this scene, uh, an elderly woman, uh, her son has died during the World War II, and she is spending the night with her daughter-in-law. And as they're sitting there, um, what she says is, um, what a treat it is to sleep in my dead son's bed. And, you know, in one sense, you might think that's not such a treat because you'd rather that your son is not dead. But there, there's, you know, there's a sort of, um, there's a tenderness uh, a, a, as well as um, a kind of um, maybe bitterness about having lost her. And, and so that's the thing with ironies, you know, frequently there's sort of layers to it and, and, and you may not know what's going on. Um, Kierkegaard sort of working with that idea uh, in this book generalizes to talk about what he calls irony as a standpoint or a position where he's thinking about a person, their consciousness or their outlook and how they relate to the world, how they relate to their particular historical time period, how they relate to um, the values, the commitments, um, the laws, the customs. And, and what he claims is basically that you can, you can think of irony in that way as well, where a person uh, would basically be opposed maybe to 
everything that is thought to be meaningful or valuable. Uh, now, the, the in this book, what he's going to argue is that Socrates, like that was his fundamental position or stance that he took to the world. And as he, for those of you who know anything about Socrates and how we typically kind of think of him, that's not how we think of him. We think of Socrates as somebody who's ironic, who uses ironic language, but not somebody who is sort of ironic in this deeper way. And so a, a big part of what Kierkegaard's project is, is, is to try to show that irony as a standpoint is a, a useful notion for, for thinking about Socrates. And so a lot of, of what we do, what we did in the course was to look at um, the different historical representations we have of Socrates. Um, typically we think of Plato, um, if, if we didn't have Plato, we wouldn't have Socrates. Socrates didn't write anything himself, uh, but we do have other uh, records of Socrates. Um, in some cases, dialogues that haven't survived where we have fragments, uh, but we, we have the writings of Xenophon, and we also have a comic play by Aristophanes called The Clouds. And so Kierkegaard sort of looks at these different uh, interpretations of Socrates and, and, and notes the differences and, and the contradictions and, and tries to argue that if Socrates really were ironic in this sort of deep way, that would best explain why it is that we see the different ways that he's portrayed uh, by, by these three writers. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting this thing to, doesn't want to, here we go. Just for time-wise, when am I trying to finish by? So um, you have about five minutes. Five minutes, wow. <laughs> okay, well. If we want to leave with five minutes for uh, questions, that's fine. But we're doing questions at the very end? No, but after your, we'll do the, your question right after you spoke. I see, okay. Well, I, I, uh, I have, as is often the case, uh, when an academic prepares a lecture, uh, you know, have way too much material. So um, I'm going to advance uh, more rapidly through these these slides uh, as this happens. Um, so we have our three 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 figures, and um, what Kierkegaard is going to argue is that in each case, there's something distorted about the way that these figures think about Socrates. But he thinks that if you kind of look at them all together. You, you could sort of triangulate to a common source that would explain uh, these differences. Um, and uh, the details, uh, I'll have to uh, spare you today, um, but uh, very briefly, uh, Xenophon thinks of Socrates as uh, a kind of practically minded person who had good advice for helping you uh, solve individual problems how to get along with your brother, maybe, who is mistreating you, or how to um, serve the state better. Um, whereas, uh, and alas, we're gonna have to skip that. Um, whereas Plato, uh, from Kierkegaard's point of view, certainly thought of Socrates as a philosopher, as somebody who's committed to ideas, to ideality, as Kierkegaard would put it. Um, so quite, quite different. Um, views there. And then Aristophanes is creating a comedy. So Socrates isn't the main character in the clouds, but he's a comic figure. Uh, and Kierkegaard thinks that, uh, unlike many scholars, that there's a great deal to be learned from Aristophanes as well about Socrates. Um, and he, so what we did in, our, in, in the course was to actually read some of these works ourselves. We read the clouds, we read uh, a, a work of, of Plato's called The Symposium. We read some selections from Xenophon. Xenophon gets sort of the short end of the stick. He doesn't get uh, much respect from Kierkegaard. He thinks that whereas Plato and Aristophanes are geniuses and they see into the, the depth of Socrates, Xenophon's kind of skimming along on the surface, doesn't tend to notice these things. Um, now, in addition to uh, the, the sort of looking at the different literary ways that Socrates is portrayed, the other thing that Kierkegaard is interested in is historically uh, data, facts that we know about Socrates. Socrates was somebody who was put on trial and, and ultimately sentenced to death. And following in the footsteps of Hegel, 
uh, Kierkegaard says he was also a world historically significant figure, somebody who um, came along at just the right moment in time to help bring about certain fundamental changes in human consciousness. Um, so that's sort of the, uh, in a very brief uh, thumbnail sketch, that's sort of the, the big argument that Kierkegaard is making over the course of his book. Um, uh, let me sort of speed along here a little bit. Uh, by the time he gets to the end, Kierkegaard will have argued Socrates is somebody who was an ironist. And that the the that this this irony was world historically justified. It came along at a time that was appropriate. Then he will briefly talk about what he calls uh, German romantic irony, and he'll say not world historically justified. It came along at a time that, you know, what it was directing itself against and criticizing was something that should be upheld and maintained. Uh, what we think of as ethical, moral values uh, in sort of, I don't know, 19th century Europe. Uh, and then where Kierkegaard ends is thinking about irony and the role that it might play in a person's uh, individual personal life. Uh, so that, that, that's sort of the, the gist of the book. Um, I had one last slide, which is um, something we saw off the... Um, our, the balcony of our apartment. Um, so we considered ourselves uh, quite fortunate. Okay, well, that is the, the very brief uh, presentation um, of my time here and, and the course I taught. Thank you. So we do have time to take a couple of questions. Um, if anybody has one, you'll maybe check the um, Zoom. Um, Megan? Well, this was. Sorry, this was very exciting because I haven't done philosophy in too long, but my question is more about why Iceland? Why did you want to bring this Kierkegaard and the irony dialogue to, um, to this place? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, ha I have the box. Well, you know, Iceland and Denmark have an interesting uh, long historical relationship, sometimes uh, better, sometimes worse. Uh, but I think um, partly that, you know, that there is just that kind of Scandinavian um, outlook. And uh, my experience has been that uh, I, when I was here 14 years ago, I also taught a, a different course on Kierkegaard and that um, I think, uh, he, Kierkegaard, even though he was writing in the 19th century, he definitely still speaks to a modern sensibility as well as maybe uh, in particular a sort of Scandinavian outlook. Uh, and uh, so some of that is just to do, you know, allowing students to sort of think about their own sort of existential predicament and, and how that might relate to, you know, some of his ideas. I actually related to that. Um, I would be interested to, to know. So um, you have a lot of teaching experience in the US. You taught here now, you taught here 14 years ago. Is there something that you'll take away from this experience that will inform your teaching back home? Or did you see a difference in the in in teaching in the different here versus in the US? Uh I, well, I did. I mean, I, I think in some ways I was uh, more surprised how, even though it's quite far from Montana, that, you know, we're, we're becoming a, a closer world in a way. And that so that some of the, I mean, one, one of the ways I was struck, I suppose, is as you get older, um, you start to notice that you know it's not so much a difference between students in Iceland and students in Montana as it is between a faculty member who's in his fifties and students in Montana or students in Iceland. Uh, but so um, I would say that in a way, like part of what was valuable to me was just seeing that some of the concerns and some of the um, you know the real challenges that the next generation faces in the world are are thought about in 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 ways that are quite similar i think and and so i mean i feel pretty hopeful about that and um 
on this at the same time, um, I would also say, uh, like with many of my students in Montana, uh, sometimes Icelandic students don't come to class. <laughs> I discovered, surprisingly. So. Um. Okay, I think we're about, was there anything? Because, yeah, we're about out of time. So um, thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, our second speaker this afternoon has also been affiliated with the Faculty of Humanities, but he's been hosted by the history department or history unit here. Um, Dr. Hopp is, is a Fulbright scholar visiting from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And while there is certainly an excellent history department here at the university, I think I can safely say that African history is not an area where the department is the strongest. So I'm sure that Kirk has made a very uh, valuable and well-received contribution here. So Kirk, the, the, the floor is yours. Hi everybody. It was a real um, it was a real gift to be here this semester, and uh, I did just so you know I, there was a a lot of positive feedback given back to me from you know the ex dean, department chair, and colleagues. I drank a lot of free coffee in the department coffee lounge, and uh, and colleagues would just volunteer how grateful they were for the program and to bring people in who could contribute things that they didn't have the kind of scope to contribute. And, you know, there's a tension at the university, I think, between an interest in being global and international, but having scholars and faculty that obviously know, know Icelandic, know the archives, know the sagas, and need to really focus on local history and national history. So it was, you know, I, I was happy to contribute to that kind of global effort. And the interest is there. I think you, you probably all realize there's kind of a, a, a new... I don't know how new it is, but there's an interest in uh, kind of new interest in the slave trade in the U.S. and in Europe and in Africa and in the Caribbean and in history of colonialism and the politics of that in the classroom and in popular culture. And that's here at the university as well. Um, I went to a panel discussion on Nordic colonialisms, which was kind of interesting. I think there were Nordic scholars trying to struggle with their role in the history of empire. And um, I know there's a program here, I didn't really have anything to do with it on, on decolonizing the curriculum at the university. And uh, I gave a talk at, at Erla's graduate seminar in decolonization and African studies. Um, so there's kind of an interest, I think, in this global movement, but there are tensions on, as I said, on kind of the, that national global level. So I taught um, right next to Paul in the basement of the, of the uh, administration building, two courses on African history, one upper level course on uh, kind of post-colonial Africa and one under level, undergraduate level course on kind of colonial and post-colonial Africa. And um, students were definitely really interesting. It was an interesting pedagogic experience. Um, I think it's a, it's a cliche and I'm generalizing, but um, there is this conversation, and I had it with colleagues here at the university, between kind of the European students' relationship to, to college and North American kind of education. And students were, I had to really work hard to, to break them down because I, I, I was also using them, I mean, don't, not to patronize, but I was using them as a primary source. I wanted to know what they thought about things. And there's definitely, again, it's a generalization, but they're, they were pretty formal, pretty quiet. And understandably, it's hard to talk about something you really don't know much about. But boy, did I, I work, I had to work really hard. I think finally towards the end, I started breaking them down. Um, and, you know, there's, there are a few connections between, there are certainly some scholars at the university who have connections to Africa and work with Africa, but nobody is teaching Africa specific courses. And there are a few historical connections. You've probably seen there's a trilogy now out in English of the, like, I think it's 1627, some North African Corsairs raided 
Iceland for, for slaves. And there's an interesting history of a Danish slave who kind of fled to the East Fjords in around 19 or 1800. Um, it has a whole DNA branch in Iceland now. Um, but in general, um, this was a lot of new stuff for the students. They're very curious. They're very interested. They were engaged. Um, and uh, here, let's see, sorry. Let me hear. So it's uh, embarrassing to have pictures of yourself in your own PowerPoint. So I'm gonna take advantage of my 12 year old, embarrass her itself. So, <laughs> so here's the, you know, building from uh, Eurovision Fire Saga, right? Um, I don't know if Icelanders think that movie is as amusing as, as we do in its own bad, good way, right? Um, but it was a real pleasure to be at the university, um, to be to talk to colleagues, to interact with students, to kind of experience a different kind of academic uh, community. Um, and here's just some action shots, which I realized I was wearing the same shirt <laughs> as you'll see in my next shot, and also the same. Obviously, I do this. No, no, <laughs> this a lot, obviously, but. Um, this is from Anna's graduate seminar. Um, this is Munda, the former dean, who was kind of helping me. And um, just again, some of the kind of decolonizing and global activities I experienced. Sorry. Oops. I get stuck. Oh, and here is me in the classroom. Um, working with the students. I had about 30 students total. Um, and I guess what I'd like to comment on now is just some kind of in intellectual ideas that being in Iceland kind of brought forth in me. It's not that I have any new, uh, new insights into this, but it certainly impacted my teaching here. And it's had a kind of a strong intellectual impact on me just thinking about these things. So for example, um, these days in the US, as I'm sure you're all aware, the whole issue of state stability since, since the um, attack on the Capitol, the whole issue of military power and civil, and, and civil stability is kind of up in the air. So when I was teaching about, for example, um, military coups in Africa and, and uh, nation state instability, it's really interesting to talk to students about it in a place that it has no military. It's totally de demilitarized. It even, the other day I was in line at Bonus and there was a police woman behind me. So I accosted her, of course. And, you know, she, I asked her about her weapons and she has no weapons. She had pepper spray. She didn't have a, fa you know, she was like, oh, we don't carry weapons. I'm like, oh my God. It's just that, that it's, you know, so talking about kind of military violence, and military coups kind of brought up new intellectual questions for me when dealing with um, Icelandic students who just right have no experience with this kind of militarization. Um, there's an also, a, just having a daughter in Osterbioskole up on the hill is interesting. So not only did I kind of have exposure to a different kind of academic ex community here, but also in the seventh grade there, really interesting contrast to be made for sure. Um, and uh, so there are three big issues that I think I used both to try to get my students to talk and had a really powerful kind of intellectual impact on me. Um, so these are things that were are really important in African history and got me thinking about Iceland. And then my Icelandic experience got me thinking about African history. So one is just urbanization, the amazing history of, of urbanization in Iceland. And it was really interesting to talk to, you know, whenever... I found an older generation Icelander. I was like, oh, you know, where'd you come? Where, how'd you get to Iraq? When did you come? How often do you go back? But in African history, the, the, there's a really powerful and important kind of colonial and post-colonial history of urban rural migration and um, the kind of problem of having one capital city where everybody lives, where all the political power and economic power is, is based. And um, so... Certainly, that's an interesting part of Atlantic history. I know that the historical context is different, but just so um, 
So just so the question of urbanization and people's relationship to their rural kind of homesteads and their families that aren't in the city, how often they go to the city, what the city means. And again, that problem of, in African history, certainly, of everything being based in a, in a capital city where if you want to do anything economically, politically, culturally, you have to be in that space. And how do resources get distributed? Um, are rural areas neglected, rural infrastructure, questions like that. Um, and number two is the, the huge importance in African history of migrant labor from the colonial period through the present. That's again, there's history of migrating from kind of rural agricultural areas to work zones, from, from rural areas to cities. Um, and pretty much every African family has a history of, of that kind of migration across borders within nation states. And also I just was talking with a, um, a migrant from Gabon who, who has this amazing kind of diaspora community as a brother in Spain and uh, you know cousins. And they, so, so kind of a European African migrant history also there, which is really interesting. <laughs> but certainly here, which what was really impactful for me is um, now what 20% of the population is non-Icelandic born. Um, the service industry, whenever I walk past a, a construction site, heavy industry, nobody's speaking Icelandic, right? So this amazing kind of revolutionary history going on right now in Iceland of, of migrants coming in, the kind of work they, they are doing, and that phenomenal kind of, I would call it almost a linguistic crisis where you have a migrant group who doesn't, doesn't speak the language. And again, in African spaces and African history, there's, there's amazingly polyglot kind of spaces, lots of different languages getting spoken. Um, so that was kind of the second intellectual, I don't know what you want to call it, kind of spark that, that was moving me this semester. And related to that, um, well, I did have one Polish student in the class, and it was interesting to talk to him because he, he said that there are no Polish students at the university, hardly at all. And partially it's because he, he only feels comfortable in English classes, and there is a tension between classes being taught in English and classes being taught in Icelandic, and the university doesn't want to become an English-speaking university, but he can't access non, you know, English-speaking classes. He dropped the course. He said it was just more worth his time to work or money than to get a university degree. So there's, there's some interesting issues going on there, I think. Um, and then related to that, and this is much more connected to my own work, which is I'm an environmental historian and I look at um, <laughs> disease control and national parks, but also ecotourism in Africa. And I'm really interested in the history of how some African nation states have historically been really dependent on, um, on ecotourism economically. And there's a really problematic kind of neo-colonial history to that about where the money comes from, where it goes, um, and the production of national parks and alienation of people from national parks. So this explosion of ecotourism in, in Iceland is really interesting to me. Students are, are tough to talk to because they just live in it. So it's hard for them to kind of get distance and talk about it. So when, when I asked my students what they thought about urbanization, they were like, I don't know, we live here, we've always lived. You know, it's, it was hard to get, get some kind of perspective on it. Um, and similar with ecotourism, I mean, this explosion of tourism in Iceland, of ecotourism, the economics of it, the cultural politics of it, the kind of the tension between privatization and public space, the number of buses, I think there are 200 cruise ships already signed up, those huge cruise ships to, to dock at Isfa, what is it? Isfa Fidor next year, we went there and that place, 200 massive cruise ships. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, this kind of um, economic cultural explosion that's going on. And it's, <clears throat> so it's, um, for me, it's really interesting to kind of see that comparative history playing out and how people are responding. And especially, um, especially what I'm interested in, or one of the things I'm interested in is kind of a cultural economic history of ecotourism in Africa, which is that 
um, in the colonial and post-colonial pe period, um, kind of, well, starting in the colonial period, there was the production of national parks and the kind of production of Africa as a, nat as a natural space, right? So tourists don't go to Africa to go to Lagos or to go to Dar. They go to see big animals and nature. And so, that, so Africa has kind of been produced as a natural space and then capital, money, infrastructure is dumped, mostly foreign capital and infrastructure is dumped into that production of Africa in that way. And then local people respond in a really interesting way in the sense that, I mean, there is, there is some, you know, exploitation and alienation. And for example, the tourist industry is really, they bring in foreign tourists. So very few local people in Africa and Tanzania, for example, work in the tourist industry because they bring, you know, Hilton Hotel brings in workers that know how to work a hotel and they, you know, it's, it's, um, it very much marginalizes local people, the capital goes to the capital city or goes abroad. So there's a there's a very there's a difference between Icelandic ecotourism and African ecotourism. But the production of cultural identity and the production of identity is what I'm interested in. And African, a lot of African people, and I'm generalizing, are very proud of their nature and proud that people come to see their nature, even though they can't afford to see their own nature. Most African people can't afford to go on safari to see their, to go to their national parks. So, um, so they're proud of it and they kind of, the way I describe it is kind of a cycle of, of um, kind of not theatrics, but of, of presentation. So since tourists wanna see um, a certain kind of Africa, Africans respond by, now you have these kind of cultural centers. There's Shaka's land, there's Sukuma land, there's um, Igbo land, the kind of Disneyfication of cultural identity. So you see, tourists wanna to see authentic Africans, but what's an authentic African? So the interesting question is what's an authentic Icelander, right? So this explosive ecotourism is going on and it's, it's being defined in a certain way. And um, let's see, here's another picture of the European kind of tourist experience. And again, it's not that it's made up, but the tourists want to experience a certain thing and um, Africans are happy to kind of, again, that kind of cycle of identity, right? So that, so Africans are responding by giving tourists this kind of experience that they're happy with. And then, and there's a cycle of this production of, of authentic identity, however you want to describe that. Um, and again, kind of the geopolitics of, of, for example, Tanzania, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, parts of Central Africa now, their primary source of foreign revenue is, is, uh, is ecotourism. And so you have these national parks, people are alienated, local people are kicked out. Um, and again, the capital is mostly international. It flows through the capital city. So again, the kind of politics and economics of tourism here is very different, but it got, really got me thinking about it. And it got me thinking about the production of, of cultural identity. So um, here's, you know, Zimbabwe used to be kind of the ecotourist playland of Africa until um, kind of it, cr it crashed with the Mugabe political crisis. But um, so I, so I do see two tracks in Iceland, right? You have the the kind of um, the the natural wonders track, and then you also have the what did I say here? the Game of Thrones, right? The Game of Thrones tour. So you have kind of the cultural track, but it's very much a rural Viking track. But when I ask my students, do you feel like Vikings? Like, do you connect to this discourse of Vikingness? You know, they're 20. They're like, no, that's, no, I do not. But it, it's interesting to see, that, again, that kind of cycle of the production of value, ecotourist value, and how people respond to it. And, and then, of course, the explosive questions of kind of sustainability and buses and infrastructure and hotels and, and sewage and restaurants and all, all these authentic ecotourist places are being served by labor that doesn't speak Icelandic, right? I mean, this bizarre kind of explosive moment in Icelandic history, which is really interesting to me and has had a huge impact on how I kind of think about African history. Um, and 
we were here and the, I mean, the, the ecotourism is unbelievable, right? It's every corner you can get, you get 10 kilometers out of the city and it's just unbelievable. But um, we were here five years ago and the difference is really noticeable on spaces we used to just like hot pots you used to walk to that now are privatized and you have to pay 5,000, right? So the question of privatizing natural space, the question of parking lots and restrooms and where you have to pay and where you don't have to pay. So this really interesting tension in how Iceland is dealing with this um, eco-cultural explosion, right? Um, so, so, yes. Um, I guess I could have asked, added horses to the Viking saga part. But <clears throat> so we certainly experienced the ecotourism, which is why it was kind of, it's kind of very much for, in the forefront of my mind. So here's just a couple shots. TJ's a really good photographer. This is Glimmer, the, the highest waterfall, 45 minutes north. Um, I think that's just about... That's just about it. Again, these three topics are kind of obvious, but what I found really powerful was, and it did impact the, my classroom experience, was um, kind of it, my thinking about Africa was fed by my experience in Iceland. And I think kind of um, what's going on in Iceland should be informed on, through the history of where it's happened in other places. Um, so anyway, that's, that's it. It was a pleasure to be here this semester. Thanks. Thank you so much and stay here because I would imagine that there would be some questions. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So this was, and sorry, <laughs> this was an amazing presentation, Kirk. Thank you so much. I, I really was thinking a lot about what you said when you said like, you know, what is an authentic African community? What is an authentic Icelander? And it got me thinking about all of these countries that are so subject to ecotourism and how their economies are building on that and how, you know, people come in and wanting to see authentic experiences, but they already come in with a preconceived notion of what that authentic experience will be. Um, and how like true identity of the cultures get lost. And so, yeah, your presentation really got me thinking about that. I wanted to give you the opportunity if you had any extra comments on that that you didn't say. I know you went really into depth, but. Well, the one word you use that, that is always intriguing to me is that even Africans will think, will, will, will say this, you know, well, what was our, what is our real history, right? What's our real identity? And the point is, there is no true authentic identity. It's always constructed. Um, so, uh, so, and, and how, for me, what's interesting about Iceland is how it really is kind of up for grabs, right? Everything is up for grabs. There's, there isn't, there aren't very many environmental controls. There aren't very many rules. They haven't decided on how to work things. So it's all kind of, you know, that the private sector versus the public sector and the state intervention and who owns land. You, if you ask people who owns like those mountains, who owns those mountains? Nobody knows. They're like, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked. Nobody ever talks about it. We don't, we, you know, it's, it's, it's this interesting moment of kind of um, necessary transformation, I think. But anyway, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're waiting in case anyone else wants to ask. I want to ask you also, and I think both of our scholars highlighted today that this is not just an individual experience, it's a family experience, right? We're, we're scholars with the family with them, and both of you, of course, brought, brought children. Um, so how do you think that this experience is, for example, has impacted your daughter? I think the impact... <laughs> You know, the impact is slow, like for, certainly her language skills are better than ours, but it takes a long time. Like we would, she would come home and say, what, what words did you learn today in Icelandic? She'd be like, shut up. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, but over time, it certainly has had, she does know some vocabulary, so knows some language. So I think it's, it's a kind of deep psychic, emotional experience. It's not something that can be articulated right away, but you know, I think for everybody, not just kids, being in a foreign culture, being in a different kind of state, experiencing a different kind of economy is really impactful. Um, I can't give specific 
examples of it. She would come home and it would be interesting. I mean, she had hugely interesting observations about how good kids English are is even though they don't have formal English training yet. And they have phrases that they pepper their language with. Some of them I won't repeat because it's a lot of profanity and I don't even know if they understand it, but they'll also see, oh my God. So they'll be speaking Icelandic and they'll be like, oh my God, oh my God, over and over again. So um, you, there's many examples I could give. There's a certain freedom that Icelandic kids have, especially in 101 that we're a little bit way more paranoid about. She'd be like, where are you going? I, I don't know where I'm going. Where's, where does this, your friend live? I don't know where she lives. When are you going to be back? I don't know when I'm going to be back. <laughs> do, 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 you know. Um, so I, I can't, I don't know yet, but I would argue that it's, it's a really valuable experience, certainly. Yeah, she would have to agree. Yeah. <laughs> Could you go back a couple of um, what do we call the slides to the one that had your name on it so I can take a picture of you? <laughs> the name of your lecture and your the date. She was a photographer who of all the pictures. Yeah. 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 To give another presentation back at UIC. <laughs> and it was in <laughs> 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 Yeah, and we're going to get both of you. Uh, by the way, we get a photo where we have both of the names. So, so Sam, and you have to be with them. Yes, yes. Um, oh, and, and before before I close, I also so both of you are getting a little Fulbright swag, a Fulbright pin, and a Fulbright water bottle. So don't. Oh, the water bottle. Yes, very fancy. Uh, <laughs> this is the. Picture okay. I'm most proud of. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much. Um... Yes, yeah, so again, I just want to thank our audience, um, both th those of you who are here in person and those who joined us virtually. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And, um, you know, I am really grateful for the Fulbright program, which allows us to foster this type of collaboration between scholars and university. Um, you know, this is an example that working together makes us stronger. And these projects are a great example of that. Um, the university is obtaining expertise that allows them to offer more variety to students and the scholars themselves, no doubt, you know, bring new perspectives back home with them. And I think we just heard a great example of that. Um, those who would be interested in hosting a Fulbright scholar uh, in their departments uh, will have an opportunity to apply. Uh, our request for scholars applications and grant program will open up again next spring. So stay tuned to our website and our Facebook page. Um, I want to thank both grantees for presenting today. I think you both did a great job. And you have made the commission proud with your work here. And, and there was never really any doubt that that would be the case, but still. So once again, let's just give them a round of applause. Um, you know, now as your grant comes to an end and you'll be returning to the US soon, I hope that you're going to be proud to call yourselves alumni of the Fulbright program in Iceland and that you're gonna stay connected to the commission, you know, hopefully for years and decades to come. And I hope also that, um, you know, the bond that you will also continue to foster ties that you've built here. Um, you know, our alumni are our most valuable asset, and we count on you to help us, you know, to build even further ties between our two countries. So thank you again, guys, for all your hard work, and thanks again to all of you.